Welcome, welcome. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Coastal Lecture Series, my name is Zach Judd. I'm the Director of Education at Florida Oceanographic Society, and I am so excited to see so many faces here with me tonight at the Blake Library. I can't see our Zoom audience, but I know you're out there watching. Hi to you guys as well. Uh, this lecture series, and I say this every week, would not be possible without our incredible audiences, both our local audience here in Stewart and our remote audience watching from around the country and really around the globe, I wouldn't be able to have such incredible speakers travel to our community if it weren't for a house full of smiling faces like you guys. So thank you a million times over for making this lecture series such a huge success. Now, here's the important part, what you guys are all here for tonight. Tonight's special guest speaker, Dr. Denise Herzing, is the founder and research director of the Wild Dolphin Project. Dr. Herzing holds a master's degree from San Francisco State University and a PhD from Union Graduate School. Since 1985, she's been monitoring a population of wild spotted dolphins in the Bahamas. Tonight, Dr. Herzing is gonna be telling us about her nearly four decade long journey working with these incredible animals. It is with my greatest pleasure that I welcome to the stage Dr. Denise Herzing. Good evening. Can everyone hear me all right? OK, great. Well, thanks for that introduction, Zach. And it's terrific to be here. Thank you to Florida Oceanographic for having me. Uh, as you know, they've done decades of great work and continue to do so. So we're happy to share what we know about the dolphins and tell you uh, our story. So I want to, um, first of all tonight, I want to tell you about the dolphins themselves, about their society and who they are as a species, so you can get to know them a little bit. And then I want to tell you about their behavior and communication, because that's primarily what we study. I want to tell you what they eat and how they forage. And then finally, I want to tell you some of the big impacts that hurricanes and climate change has been having on the dolphins. And then we'll just finish with some of the tools that uh, researchers are using all over the world to monitor marine mammals specifically. Now, I started my work because I was inspired by the primatologists that were out there studying um, great apes and, uh, and even the um, Cynthia Moss who studied elephants. So I picked a spot where I could watch these animals underwater and try to get a handle on their society. So most of what we do is by observation. Now, the reason I chose the Bahamas is because in most parts of the world, the water is just simply too uh, murky to observe underwater. So you might see dolphins jumping like this, but you don't really know what they're doing underwater till you, till you look. And in fact, they're probably fighting underwater. They're not playing, which is what most people think. So we spend our time underwater. My primary tool is underwater video uh, with a hydrophone, which is an underwater microphone. And of course, we have GoPros and all sorts of new things these days. And our work is non-invasive. Uh, we are almost at 40 years and four generations of dolphins. So we basically go out every summer and observe these dolphins. Now, the species are Atlantic spotted dolphins. And the calves are born without spots. And they gradually get spots, like you see here this animal, uh, Muggsy. She's 35 years old in this photograph. We use nicks and notches in their dorsal fin, which is typical of dolphin researchers when you're working from the surface. But because we work underwater, we can also use their great spot patterns, which are like constellations. The, that's how we track individuals. So every summer we go out, re-photograph them, and re-ID them, and, and track them through their lives. Now, you all know where you are in uh, Florida here. We work primarily in the northern Bahamas, uh, historically off Little Bahama Bank on the top there in West End, and recently down in Bimini, down on a Great Bahama Bank. And it's a, great, it's a great place to be a dolphin, but it's also nice as a researcher because the water is shallow, it's clear, it's relatively safe from sharks, so you can be in the water a lot and not uh, worry too much. Um, we work on a 62-foot power catamaran that my nonprofit got donated in 1992. That was a miracle in itself, which I can tell you about later. Um, so we live, we sleep, we eat on board the boat for about 10 days. Uh, and then we come back to Florida, refuel, reprovision, then we go back out. And we do this five months throughout the summer. And yeah, we work in the summer. It's hurricane season, but believe it or not, it's usually the best weather 
to be out there really because of the direction of the winds and how protected we are by the uh, island masses themselves. Now, some take home information if, if your kids want to know how to use sex a dolphin, mommy. Um, basically, everything's internal, right? So the females have little mammary slits uh, next to their genital slits. The males just have a long slit and a little anal slit. So that's how we sex all these dolphins, so we know males from females. And of course, that does not change, at least as far as we know. Now, uh, here's an example. So I met this individual, Little Gash, in 1985. At that point, she had no spots, but she had this tiny little gash in her fin that we could use for identification. Then over the years, she got a, 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 a notch in her tail stock, and then gradually she got these spot patterns. So this is how we would literally track an individual, and every dolphin is really quite unique. For example, here's uh, an individual named Lava. She's at age three and she has some spots where you see the red arrow. Now she's age six. She gets a few more spots. We call her speckled and she's a juvenile in that shot. Here she is at age 12. She's a young adult called modeled. This is the age where females become sexually mature. And then finally here's, uh, here's Lava at 15. She's an old adult. We call her fused. And this is the age where the males mature sexually. So the females mature uh, a bit earlier than the males. There's a joke in there somewhere, too, I know. <laughs> so of course, dolphins are mammals, right? And so they nurse. And specifically, they nurse for three to four years, uh, usually depending on when the uh, female gets pregnant again. So they have three to four years uh, in between births. But the first year, we have about a 25% mortality. And that's pretty mammalian, but that's just uh, mother nature, right? Uh, we lose calves at that age. Now, this is just a, a quick little graph just showing that the years between births pretty much averages uh, three to four on the bottom graph. Uh, this is uh, calves that have survived more than one year. The top graph, what, what happens is if a mother's pregnant, she gives birth, the calf dies for whatever reason, sharks or, or disease. Um, she'll go into estrus quite quickly and mate again, so she'll really have a quick turnover of a year interval. But typically, three to four years is the interval for um, giving birth. Now, juveniles are about, we consider them juveniles about age four to eight. They're kind of away from their moms now, and they're wreaking havoc in the society. They're like little teenage gangs running around, fighting and, and making trouble as you could expect. So they're playing with sargassum. They're learning how to fight and how to, how to play. Again, very mammalian and very important for their development. They're learning how to become an adult dolphin safely by playing uh, as a juvenile. Now, um, one thing we know is that females associate by reproductive status. So for example, here you have, um, you have two adults, Little Gash and Rose Mole. So when I went out there in 1985, they were juveniles. And they were, you know, making trouble like everybody. So then Rosemole got pregnant. And Little Gash was still dating the guys, but she, she wasn't pregnant. So they kind of separated. They hung out, uh, Rosemole hung out with other females that were pregnant or had calves. Then Little Gash finally got pregnant. They both had their little calves, little Rosebud and little Haley. And then they all started hanging out together. So it's a really interesting a thing to watch, as you can imagine, females uh, probably need more food and substance when they're pregnant, so they have to hang out where other mothers are, where the good food is. Now, we measure this uh, by uh, basically measuring a coefficient of association, which basically just tells us how much they're together. So for example, a mother and a calf, COA in year one is 0.94, which means they're pretty much always together. It drops off year two, year three, it goes down, and then finally year four, which is the year where the mother probably gets pregnant again, it really drops down. They still hang out, but not as much. So that's something we know about the females. Um, pregnancy is about a year, and uh, calving every three to four years. So this is a very pregnant uh, dolphin named Katie. I met her in 1986, her mother's blotches. And Katie had uh, our first third generation dolphin named Kai. He was born in 2000. And so um, yeah, they get really, really pregnant. We haven't seen a birth, but it sure looks like they're going to pop when we're out there sometimes. So they can have really extensive family trees. This is an example of 
blotches, Katie's mom, this is all her offspring, and then her offspring's offspring, so those are her grandkids. Uh, this is really how we track their family lines. Not everybody survives, but we can see who's related to who. Now the males are doing something different. The males are forming uh, teams and alliances pretty much when they're kind of late juveniles, so they've been practicing fighting and getting in trouble. And their coefficient of association is actually uh, the second highest in the whole society. So they're very tightly uh, bonded, the males are. Now, we really want to know who sires the offspring, so we have to collect DNA for that. And we basically scoop their poop, right? <laughs> These are my, my uh, graduate students. We call them my femme facals. Swimming behind the dolphins, scooping poop in the water, of, and we know which dolphin just defecated. And it turns out if you analyze their DNA, uh, either their mitochondrial DNA or microsatellites, which is used for paternity, it looks like the older males are siring the most offspring, right? So you may see the younger males you know, mating and engaging females all the time, but the old males, they're the ones that actually you know, count as far as siring offspring. Now, this is some video footage, I hope we'll... So this is old footage, it's not so clear, but it's really cool. So little Gash and her calf, two-year-old calf is underneath her. The male is upside down. There's a group of males around. He's trying to get underneath the mate. That's how they mate, right? So they stack up underneath her, trying to get their chance at her. What I think is really cool about this video is that the calf is just in the way, but the calf is hearing and seeing everything that's going on. So they're getting exposed to the whole social system, even as a calf. There's a lot of social exposure. So the males just keep trying to mirror her, mate with her. And if she's not interested, she'll actually slap them away. Pretty interesting. Now, there are also bottlenose dolphins out in the Bahamas where we work. And they're about three feet larger than the spotteds. And we see them together. And uh, this is something I didn't expect. When I went out, I was planning to work with the spotted dolphins primarily. But we see them together about 15% of the time when we see the spotted. So they have a pretty interesting relationship. I've had graduate students that have studied just the bottlenose dolphins. And they have kind of a similar life history. They give birth every three to four years, they you know, form maternal groups and male alliances, that sort of thing. They dig in the bottom for uh, fish like the spotteds do. But what's really interesting is that they forage together a bit, not very often, that red arrow is pointing out a bottlenose dolphin amongst the spotteds. But the young uh, female spotted dolphins babysit young uh, calves of bottlenose, which is really interesting. So interspecies babysitting. Uh, on the left corner, you see a uh, bottom. You see uh, male bottlenose dominating. It will mount and copulate with male spotted as a dominance. So they're actually trying to get at each other's females, which is really interesting. And they do hybridize a bit. So there's a lot of competition for uh, mates, regardless of what species. Now, the male alliances of both species, they will also help each other. So if they're fighting, so if we have a group of bottlenose fighting spotteds and a big shark comes in the area, they'll like stop fighting, they'll form a group and they'll chase the shark away. So, so it's pretty cool. They really know each other as neighbors and they fight, but they also help each other. So very cool interspecies behavior. Now, we do know quite a bit about their sound and their communication. Um, in the upper left, we see a signature whistle which is a frequency modulated whistle. And this is like an individual name. So they have specific names. On the upper right, this is, that was a burst pulse squawks. They're fighting sounds, basically. Uh, on the bottom left, we have echolocation clicks, which is their sonar for digging in the sand and navigating. <laughs> On the bottom right, we have uh, buzzes, which are considered, they're kind of clumps of clicks. They're disciplinary buzzes, buzzes they use to chase sharks away. 
Um, one cool thing that the dolphins do So they synchronize their vocalizations like you just heard. Those are synchronized squawks. And so they're kind of like a football huddle. They'll synchronize their, their physical behavior and their vocalizations. And this makes them kind of look bigger and badder. And, and, but it's, it's pretty pertinent to their lives. Now, um, this video is really cool and really rare. This is a group of bottlenose dolphins. And what you're going to see and hear uh, you're going to see them synchronize their postures. They're kind of kind of turn to each other and whistle and squawk, and then turn away, and then they're going to turn and whistle and squawk. And it's very rhythmic. It just give you, gives you an idea of uh, how specific they use this for. What they're saying, but they're saying something interesting. Now, one of the challenges with uh, studying specifically acoustics of dolphins, uh, well, there's many challenges, but one of them is we want to know if they have something like a language or they have some kind of order and structure to their sounds. Um, now, in larger, the larger field of animal communication, what we're looking for is either a referential signal or a graded signal. What that means is so a referential signal just means something that's labeled. Like your name is a word, right? It's a word. It refers to something. So on the, um, on the left side, you see those signature whistles again. Um, and they're whistles. You basically would hear those whistles in the water. They'd sound like <whistles> right? Um, they're human hearing. They're kind of read like a musical score, right? So frequency, time. And those are considered referential signals. So they're names of specific dolphins. On the right, the squawks and things you've been hearing, that's considered more of a graded signal, which means it's just uh, expressing emotion and motivation of an animal. So we have both. I'm talking to you with words, but I'm flailing my hands, and I'm talking loud and talking excited sometimes, right? And these are all signals that modify my words. So we don't know what a lot of animals have, and, and specifically dolphins. Now, We've known for many decades that some terrestrial animals, specifically um, vervet monkeys, have uh, signals for specific predators. So they can make a specific alarm call that tells their buddies that there's a, a leopard chasing them or there's an eagle in the sky, and then their friends can take this, the appropriate action. Um, we know this from prairie dogs. Actually, some incredible work has been done with prairie dog alarm calls to signal the colony about there's a human walking in the field with a gun. or <laughs> Just amazing work. So we know terrestrial animals do this, and it's survival, right? It's a smart thing to be able to refer to something specifically. So you can imagine it would be pretty important for a dolphin maybe to have a label for a type of shark. This is a hammerhead shark. Two juveniles are chasing them because they're just fun and harassing them. But um, you can imagine it'd be pretty important for an animal to signal, oh, there's a big tiger shark who's going to go after us versus a nurse shark that's harmless, for example. So we look for those kinds of things to try to get a handle on what their communication system is like. Uh, now, this is uh, just a group of spotted dolphins fighting. I just wanted to give you a sense of what that is. And again, you're going to see kind of two groups separate. Um, they're going to take head-to-head -head stances, again, which is mammalian and kind of aggressive. And they're going to squawk in their mouths. So how are you going to interpret all this, right? It's a bit of a muddle. So uh, I will tell you right off, there are two big challenges uh, working with dolphins. And um, they involve, number one, looking at high frequency signals, right? So we know dolphins you know, make echolocation that's really high, ultrasound like bats, et cetera. So for example, this spectrogram sound uh, picture, 
You see on the bottom left where it says narrow band, those are the whistles you've been hearing. That's our hearing range there, about to 15 kilohertz, kind of max. The rest of the image is uh, an image of sound collected to 110 kilohertz, way above our hearing. And what you start noticing is, number one, you see harmonics that are created naturally, but harmonics which give cues, gives cues to the animals. You also see, we knew, we knew their clicks were broadband. We've known that with the Navy forever. But what we noticed is also there are places in our sound files where there's nothing in the lower frequencies, which means if we were only recording in narrow band, we wouldn't even know a sound is there, right? So it's, it's like studying any animal. You have to know what its sensory system is and the range of information. Now, the other big thing is we want to know who's making the sound when it happens, right? You just saw that muddle of dolphins. So we've work, worked with various colleagues over the years. We finally have a prototype in the water. Um, it's basically a, a unit on the bottom right. You see it's a hydrophone array with four hydrophones and a video camera in there. And basically what that array is doing, uh, it's recording sounds coming in at different times, and then it can localize who's making the sound. And then it uh, puts a image on the video after it's processed. So all those little red squares are showing us that each dolphin is making echolocation clicks. So it's a start. So what we want to do basically is look at, OK, mothers and calves, when they're whistling at each other, does the mother whistle and then the calf? Or you know, how does that kind of interplay? Or if a, a group of dolphins is fighting, you know, is one dolphin making all the squawks and, and the threats? Or is it you know, a bunch of them? So a lot of unanswered questions, honestly. Um, but you need the technology in the water. Now, um, one of the really cool things we're doing right now, and I, I can't probably go into too much detail, but um, it's using machine learning, which you all know you've heard of this, artificial intelligence, to help us um, label our spectrograms so that top picture you see is labeling by color types of sounds that the computer has coded with our help a little bit. Um, and then it pulls out uh, patterns. So where you see on the bottom, you see patterns. Each of those colored rows is a type of sound that the computer has said, these are all the same, so I'm going to make them all brown, or I'm going to make them all green. Then what we can do is start looking at the orders of sound types. So sound type A is followed by sound type L, followed by E. So it starts looking at what well, we would have phonemes in our language, for example, we'd look at that process, you know, what follows what. Um, and then we can look at really advanced aspects of what kind of rules or order are there uh, in these patterns. If A is followed by B, it's followed by A, D, D, is that a specific sequence that a mom is, is uh, producing to her calf? So it's a really cool work, but it's really difficult, I tell you. I'm, I've learned a lot. I work with a group of uh, computer scientists up at uh, Georgia Tech primarily, and I work with multiple students of theirs. And it's exciting work, but it's really, really challenging in, in many ways. And I'm happy to talk to you later in more detail if anybody's interested in that. So um, the dolphins spend um, a lot of their time feeding during the day on the sandbank. And this is like you know, 10 feet to 40 feet kind of depth. They um, love to dig razor fish. They use their clicks under the sand. Um, to find the fish. Sorry. We really tried to lower the sound. I don't know what happened. I think that's the last nasty one. Um, bottlenose also dig in the sand. Uh, they use a couple of unique sounds. Razor buzz, which sounds like a shaving razor, and uh, trills. I call them digital trills. <laughs> And, and bottlenose are digging for really deep fish like eels, uh, whereas the spotteds are kind of going after flounder and razorfish primarily. Uh, they have different diets. This is from uh, one of my master's students, uh, Chris Malinowski. Over the years, he sort of tallied what sort of uh, fish we saw them eat. So they have a pretty good variety of fish, um, just quite different. Like I said, the bottlenose are digging deeper in grass beds. They're going for eels. Jack sometimes, uh, where the spotteds are eating lizardfish, razorfish, uh, ballyhoo, that sort of thing. So they have a pretty good diet. Um, another cool project one of my students did was um, 
looking for teaching, right? So how do you measure teaching in, in dolphins? So she took our video and she said, okay, I'm gonna measure the time that the mother spends around the calf chasing a fish or versus when she's alone chasing fish without a calf. And when she put the data together, what you see is the, on the, um, the horizontal, you see the names of the mothers, Little Gash, Muggsy, et cetera, et cetera. And the seconds that they spent uh, when, let's see, I'm gonna point it with a laser pointer on this bottom data line here. Um, the number of seconds, it was really quick, of course, when they're just eating themselves, but when they're with their calf, there's extreme, extreme separation. It takes them a long time. So they're basically teaching them, encouraging them, you know, chasing up the fish and then letting the little calf uh, uh, you know, chase it and eat it. So this is how they learn. And this is considered teaching in all definitions of uh, scientific terms anyway. Now at night, the dolphins also have a pretty interesting life. They go off uh, the shallow bank, the um, western side of the sand bank, and they drift along the deep water uh, to feed at night. And here's a shot uh, by a colleague of ours, uh, Nick. And they are chasing flying fish and squid, very deep in the water, and, and they spend all, pretty much all night doing it. So they are just, this guy looks kind of fat, huh? Um, so anyway, fatty fish, squid, that's really one of the main sources of their food. I think the, the daytime feeding, I think is more like snacking, resting, dolphin potato chips, I don't know, <laughs> something like that. But they're definitely cashing in at night when they're feeding. And uh, well, this is kind of small for you to see, but basically this is just showing that, you know, they can be found somewhere between, you know, uh, 300 feet and 900 feet of depth, usually in the sandbank, and they'll drift, you know, for hours and hours. We've done some all night drifts with them, and they just keep drifting and eating. Now, um, we've had a few natural experiments on the on the sandbanks. Not that we liked it, but um, I just want to talk about some of those impacts. So the uh, hurricanes of 2004 and 2005 were pretty intense. Uh, as you know, they hit Stewart, right? They hit right here. The uh, Pink Star is our study site. And Francis, the first storm was stationary and direct. It hovered over our study site for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, actually a day and a half. Um, Jean hit three weeks later. And then the next year we had Wilma, which was a storm from the Gulf of uh, Mexico, but it came over also to the study site. And when we got back out um, to look to see how our dolphins did, we found that we lost 30% of both species, bottlenose and spotted, um, leaned a little heavily towards the young animals, as you might expect. But um, we had new bottlenose move in to replace the ones, I guess, that died or maybe they moved. Um, the, what was really striking to me was it totally destabilized the behavior of the spotted dolphins. You know, we knew their behavior really well and who they hung up with and they just they just weren't acting normal. They their groups were really discombobulated, um, and we had some new spotted show up in the area. Maybe they were from some other place that we didn't study. But um, it took them years and years and years to restabilize, and um, because they started calving again, of course, they started reaching their normal levels, which is about a hundred. You know, their population is small, about a hundred animals. Um, by 2012, they were kind of getting there, back to normal, acting normal, back to their numbers. So that was, that was encouraging, but it was shocking, actually, to me, that how hard hit they were. But it can, if you can imagine surviving a hurricane for 36 hours, you know, you're a young animal, you have to be able to breathe and, you know, go back into the water, and the, there's, you know, water in the, in the air the whole time. So anyway, predators around, I imagine it's challenging. Then another thing happened. So in 2013, uh, we went out there and, you know, we had always uh, measured our groups as three clusters. So we had a southern cluster, a northern cluster, and a central cluster. And they were pretty distinct behaviorally and genetically. Um, and in 2013, we went out there and the central group was completely gone. And after some frantic looking, we finally found them uh, down in Bimini on Great Bahama Bank, crossing about a, about 100 miles difference, crossing this deep water, which we didn't know they really did. Um, 
they're dolphins, but still, we never saw them do it before. And you know, it was really interesting. We had kind of anecdotally noticed that, gosh, the fishermen aren't fishing off the, the edge of the sandbank anymore. And, and we stopped seeing, oh, I'm sorry, flying fish and squid. It was like, where's all the prey? And so I guess the dolphins, just they just had to move. Um, so that was kind of a shocker. So we decided, after we kind of eliminated uh, Navy sonar and orcas and you know some of the things you can imagine would scare the dolphins enough to leave, um, we started looking at oceanographic features, right? So we tapped into a uh, database called Copapod, Coastal and Ocean Oceanic Plankton Ecology Production and Observation Database. Phew, Copapod. And uh, so it's so a NOAA database that was available to us. And so we decided to look at both Little Bahama Bank and Great Baha Bahama Bank and see uh, what we could see in their database to see if there's any changes. And this is based on satellite imagery, right? This is not you know, hands-on in the Bahamas measurements. Everything is, is taken from satellite imagery and um, as a proxy. So we, we wanted to look at uh, surface chlorophyll, which is uh, a measure of a proxy for plankton, right? The food chain. We wanted to look at the wind speeds and the sea surface temperatures in both those spots. So when we took a look, we saw the satellite chlorophyll um, had a significant drop at Little Bahama Bank. So you see on the left side the, um, the blue. It's, a, it's a, actually a measure of anomalies over the years. So that's a yearly. That's from 1998 through 2015 is the, is the measurement. So there was a significant drop in chlorophyll on Little Bahama Bank, but not on uh, Great Bahama Bank. There was some, but not significant. The sea surface temperature, there were fluctuations, again, but nothing actually significant. The winds were quite significant in um, both places. So the, the, the wind speeds just more off the scale, both in both locations. And you know, again, we kind of noticed this. You know, we're out there all summer. It was like, it's always windy. <laughs> Why is it always windy? So then we thought, OK, well, maybe we should look at the shallow sand bank versus the deep water, right? Because they're kind of two different ecologies, I guess, ecosystems. And we thought it'd be pretty interesting to look at. So we, we blocked off areas on the sand bank, Little Bahama Bank, Offshore and shallow, same on Great Bahama Bank. We did sand bank and offshore. And um, what we found is the only place where the chlorophyll was really significant on Little Bahama Bank was on the shallow, on the shallow sand bank. So this suggests a food crash. Now, what was also really interesting is um, because the wind speeds had increased in both locations significantly over you know a decade, we thought wow, how would that affect you know, production, you know, plankton production? We don't know for sure. But what we did notice, and this was actually not in the NOAA database, we actually collected um, wind direction when we're out there. And we had seen, I don't know if you all remember, you, some of you probably live here in the summer, we've had uh, wind coming from the west and southwest in the summer a lot instead of southeast, which is the direction. So you can imagine, so on the sand bank, there's a tidal flow, right? Six hours on, six hours off. And you can, when you're out there, you can actually see on this beautiful you know, blue sand bank, you can see the murky but productive water coming off the sand bank from the grass beds and all that. You can see the, t the line. And then it goes offshore, and then it comes back with the beautiful gulf, gulf water, right? And so when it's windy, you could see that the wind actually stopped that um, murkier water from getting offshore. And so we suspect maybe that was part of the issue and the food crashed because the nutrients weren't getting offshore, they were stopping. Oh, we're not sure. And I've talked to a lot of population ecologists, and nobody's quite sure what to make of it. But it was pretty clear that the food chain uh, crashed. Anybody has any ideas, please talk to me. So as of last year, 2022, um, of the 52 displaced spotted from the central group that moved, we did have four uh, individuals come back to where they were uh, resident, and they've stayed. And we didn't actually know. We, at first, we were like, could they just be lost? <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. Could they be lost? Did the hurricane blow them somewhere, and they don't know where they are? But four of them came back, so we think, OK, they probably knew where they were and found their way back home. 
Um, all the other dolphins that moved uh, from Little Bahama Bank, they've stayed on Great Bahama Bank around Bimini, and they are now trying to um, interact and associate with the already resident group of spotteds there. So when these displaced dolphins moved, they moved into someone else's territory, right? So this is what's also happening around the world with climate change and raising uh, sea levels as animals that usually don't interact are starting to interact. So they moved into someone else's territory already. Um, the spotteds that moved from Little Bahama Bank they are now feeding off that deep water edge nocturnally, so that's kind of the pattern they had in their previous home. So at least they've uh, been able to do that. And their reproduction looks pretty healthy. Actually, they're calving well, which is great. Um, but then we had some recent storms. 2016, we had Hurricane Matthew, which was a direct hit on West End. It was actually supposed to hit us, and right at the last minute it veered in the Gulf Stream and hit West End, and that was a, a big hit. And then in 2017, we had Hurricane Irma. That was a really bad year. And Maria, those also went through the Bahamas. So it was like, oh, come on. <laughs> Give my dolphins a break, you know. Uh, so we don't really know what the big impact of that was. We're still kind of monitoring and checking it out. We have seen um, more of our animals from Little Bahama Bank up north move to the south. Uh, so you see the central group now, and now you see some northern animals and southern animals that have also moved. Um, we don't know totally what's going on, uh, Little Bahama Bank. There are some remnant uh, spotted dolphins up there, but not many, and not many bottlenose either, so it's a bit of a, a wasteland. Um, there's some, but not a lot. So uh, recently, we did a paper on how the displaced dolphins were integrating with the resident bimini dolphins. It's pretty interesting. So like, what happens when you move into someone else's territory? Is there enough food? Do you mate with each other? You know, what, what goes on? Um, so it's a lot of data analysis. And basically, uh, what we found is that the two groups basically started associating more, as you would suspect, I guess, they have to, to a certain extent. Um, they still did prefer their own groups. So they kind of stayed with their groups, even while they were interacting uh, with the local, local dolphins. Um, the male alliances were still present, um, but we had some um, defections. So we had a couple, uh, couple of the, how shall I say this, the very bold males of our group moving into male alliances with the, uh, the new guys. So that was pretty interesting. So, so that shifted. But still, their new and old relations were heavily uh, influenced by the whole restructuring. So, Basically, you know, it's a big mixture, they're getting along, they're calving, but it's still, you know, it's still a mixture. And we're still trying to do genetics to find out really who's siring the offspring. So is it males from the resident group? Uh, are the immigrants, you know, still siring offspring? We don't know. And if you're interested in any of our research papers, uh, they can be found on our website uh, under the research and library. Now, some of the tools, I just want to talk briefly about some of the tools that researchers are using all over the world to monitor change. Uh, the first tool is a really a passive acoustic tool. So these are various uh, units, uh, sound collecting units that uh, researchers use, and they're uh, basically passive acoustic monitoring devices. They sit on the bottom of the ocean or they're uh, you know, um, mounted on the bottom of the ocean, and they collect data while you're not there. So you can set them out, leave them going for uh, months, actually, and some even go a year now. Uh, so in 2018, we actually did this. We set up uh, a device called the EAR, Ecological Acoustic Recorder. And it was basically a lot of battery, a hard drive, a uh, hydrophone that would record sound. And it was uh, set up to record sound uh, every five minutes for 30 seconds. And so you de we deployed them, then one, th one month later we'd pick them up, swap out hard drives, put it back, et cetera, et cetera. And so what was really cool, though, is we were able to um, find some of our lost dolphins from the data. So it, basically the data would give us uh, clicks, high-frequency clicks, uh, high-frequency whistles, low-frequency whistles, and that was basically species-specific. And so what we did, so on the bottom left is actually just a graph by date. So this uh, was data from June. 
June 2018. And we were able to look at this graph and go, OK, oh, the dolphins went by here on uh, June 15th. And, and they were here, whistling away. So we looked at the tidal cycle and said, OK, let's try to get out there during the same tidal cycle the next month to see if that is maybe when they came by. And sure enough, we went out there, and there were some of our dolphins. And because there were so few dolphins left, we really wanted to find the ones that you know, we were looking for. So it was really a valuable tool to show us the activity of who went by when. And researchers really use this all over the world. They can look at species, you know, when species go by, the activity, that sort of thing. Now drones, of course, uh, everybody's using drones. This is a great uh, view that we haven't had on marine mammals. Did, a lot of you probably saw the right whale video the, from the drones, the aerial video. That was fantastic, right? So it's a fantastic tool to just see animals. Um, in our case, we found, because we're on our research boat, we found it wasn't so productive to find dolphins just by looking, because you know the drones still have limited battery life, and, and you can't fly them dur during certain wind speeds. So they have some limitations. Um, but if you see dolphins, you put up the drone, you can follow them, you can look at their group configuration in the water, you can look who's leading the pack, for example. Um, you can look at what habitat use they go over. So there's a lot, a lot of uses for, for drones. And one of the main tools actually is looking at the health of animals now. They can take a drone and they can look at whether an animal's pregnant, emaciated, that sort of thing. So they're being used all over the world for large whales uh, as well as dolphins. Just some closing thoughts, and then I guess we can have some question and answer. So there's a lot of impacts that are going on uh, with ocean animals because of these environmental changes and climate changes. I really never expected the dolphins of the Bahamas to have such dramatic impacts. I really didn't, because they were, they were really considered you know, fairly safe. They didn't have a lot of fishing net issues. And, I mean, there's pollution everywhere, but you know they were a relatively healthy population. So we felt like, wow, we have this view of this great healthy population that's normal. And then all of a sudden, the food crashes, right? So things change. So this is happening everywhere. And um, because dolphins and whales are so mobile, you know, they have the ability to adjust their locations. But at what cost? You know, are they going to not be able to integrate with uh, local animals, disturbing their resources? You know, this is a big, big question. There's not room for everybody necessarily. Um, and you know, the the only reason we knew what was happening with this displaced activity with the dolphins is because we were out there every year, and we knew individuals, we knew their relationships, and we knew where they were, so we could see the changes. And you know, long-term research is really, really important. Because if you don't have the baseline, you're not going to see the changes. You're never going to notice uh, what's happening. So all these you know, projects you hear about, uh, believe me, they're important. Long-term research, whether it's turtles or dolphins or whales. And the tools and techniques, they can all be um, you know, really important. And, and <laughs> all, you know, the students now are so smart and so tech savvy. I mean, I'm just in awe. Like, thank god they exist, right? writing programs. So I'm just the old naturalist with my binoculars. You know? <laughs> but anyway, so think global, act global. I think we have to do it all, act lo local and act global, I think. Um, and just some selfless promotion. Uh, we are having our annual event called Wild Ocean Science on February 25th. I think there's still uh, uh, information back to pick up there. If you want to come by, Carl Safina is a well-known um, author and naturalist. And there's a virtual option, too, if you want to um, just come on virtually. But we're excited. It's, it's kind of our, only once a year, our way of giving to the public and getting a good speaker and, and sharing that information. So thank you. And I will leave it open for questions. <laughs> Let's see. Right there. Right, so um, the northern uh, bank just had a food collapse, and some dolphins went to the southern bank. How do you think they knew to go to the southern bank? That's the big question. Oh, sorry. Yes, so the question is, 
the northern dolphins moved to the next sandbank down. How did they know to go there to look for food, right? So interestingly, um, we had actually done some work on the Great Bahama Bank previously, kind of in winter and kind of odd times. And we had never seen any photographic matches. And there was another research group also down there, and we looked at their catalog. So we didn't think they ever went down there, right? You ever saw that? So we were like, well, I don't know. Did they move as a group and just run into it? Did they send a scout? <laughs> oh, it's possible. I mean, we didn't see when they moved. You know, somewhere between September when we finish our field season and the next May, they were gone. Right? So they could have scouted the area. I don't know. I mean, that's a really great question, and I wish we knew. Yeah, I don't know. Now, the fact that the other four animals, oh, sorry. Well, so we actually had a good follow-up to that online. Uh, somebody mentions that uh, some of the great whales, humpback whales, for example, have songs that can be heard over the course of hundreds of miles. Is it possible that they could hear each other from the Little Bahama Bank to the Great Bahama Bank, or is that stretching it for, for dolphin communication? Yeah, I think for dolphin communication, um, that would be stretching it. As far as we know, their sounds wouldn't transmit that far, correct? How about uh, when they moved all the Yeah, so the question is about moving the beach sand, you mean off the coast here? Yeah, so well, we do study the dolphins off this coast too. The question was, did the dolphins leave and come back? Yeah, I couldn't answer that. Our work is really in the Bahamas, so that's really across the Gulf Stream. Um, yeah, I mean, I imagine for local dolphins off our coast, you could easily disturb that substrate, you know, if you're, you know, dredging sand and putting it on the beach and, you know, Nobody really studies that, as far as I know. Can you tell us about dolphins breathing? Dolphins what? Breathing. How much they eat, how often they breathe. Can I tell you about dolphins breathing? Yes, they breathe. No. Um, yes, so, so dolphins have one blowhole. You know, most whales have two. And they breathe according to their activity, basically, right? I mean, they're really efficient at using air, first of all, right? So they'll come up to the surface, breathe, and they can hold their breath for, you know, anywhere to 20 minutes, probably a small dolphin at depth. And they store most of their uh, uh, oxygen in their muscle, their myoglobin versus their hemoglobin. So they can dive deep, um, shunt all their, uh, you know, blood and oxygen to the critical organs. But like, you know, when they're feeding on the bottom, They'd probably be down two or three minutes, for example. Um, they could be fighting down there for a minute or two. I, you know, they're not on the bottom a lot. They're at the surface a lot, or in the middle of the water column. But it really depends on, I guess, their energy expenditure more than anything. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's go over here. So what do dolphins do when they fight? So you saw some video. So remember, they're mammals, right? They play and they, they have fun and they love each other probably, but they also fight. You know, they fight for food, they fight for sex, they fight for all of it, right? So when they're fighting, so what you saw was pretty toned down. You know, they're, they're doing head-to-head -head postures like you might see, you know, rams, you know, ramming each other. They open their mouths, they're making sounds, but they'll, they'll ram and charge each other. They'll slap each other hard. I mean, there's never been a dolphin, well, I take that back. There's never been an observed dolphin death during fighting, but dolphins are, are known for infanticide also. So yeah, so there's been a lot of strandings of uh, calves, dolphin, uh, bottlenose calves on the uh, East Coast, and they look like they're really uh, impact marks, you know, from bottlenose probably slapping them around. And in the uh, Scotland area, the bottlenose kill harbor porpoise. They toss them around. Nobody knows why, but just blunt impact. I don't know if they think they're toys or they're, they're threatening them. But no, they fight. They fight with what they have. Their tails are really strong. Their flukes are really strong. They can make really deep rake marks. 
Now, we have never seen a spotted dolphin really hurt each other, but I've seen the bottlenose fight big time. And the sound, so sound is much more potent underwater than in the air, like the decibel level. So it's like a, you know, a, a, a exploding gun cap under the water. It could actually really hurt your ears. And I've heard sounds where it's like, ah, and they could hurt each other with sound, right? Projecting sound, yeah, like a big, like a gun actually underwater. Yeah, are dolphins ever aggressive with people? Uh, yes, they have been, um, both in captivity and in the wild. Um, you know, my suspicion is because people are doing stupid things to the dolphins, right? I'll give you an example. There was a friendly dolphin off the coast of Brazil for many years, a while ago, and I believe it was a female bottlenose. And you know, kids would swim with her and blah, blah, blah. And I hate to say it, but two Americans were down there and they decided to jump on her and stick a cigarette in her blowhole. Oh. So guess what the dolphin's gonna do? I mean, if you jumped on someone in New York City and did that, you know, you wouldn't last very long, right? So I think she actually, uh, you know, slapped him with the tail and one guy died from internal bleeding. So now they have a killer dolphin, like, really? <laughs> yeah, seriously, so they were thinking of moving, trying to move her somewhere and then finally uh, there was a, uh, biologist Marcos down there, and he finally tried to explain to him that it's like it's the human behavior that you know she's defending herself, et cetera. Um, there are other, a few other kind of fluky instances. I, there was some weird instance off the Bahamas not so long ago where some woman was just swimming, and I guess a dolphin came and beat her up. So you kind of go, did the dolphin, was it neurotic? Did it get injured by a human and it was pissed off? I mean, you don't know what you know, these animals have had in their lives, right? what's happened, you know? So, but I wouldn't say it's common, but I would also say that not every dolphin in the world wants to have a human in the water. You know, they have their lives, right? I mean, their lives, they don't need us, you know? They have plenty to do and interesting lives without us, so. When you try to get too friendly with them or you try to disrupt their behavior, like for example, our work, because it's in the water, we're really careful about how we act. You know, and we, we think we know a fair amount about their etiquette and how to behave, but if they give us signals sometimes, like they don't want us in the water, and they have, you know, they'll come up and they'll go, Arr! and we're like, okay, we'll go back to the boat now. And we get out of the water, because we're like, okay, they're nicely letting us know that they just don't want us in the water. And sometimes we don't know why. We didn't feel like we did anything. But it's just like they want to be alone or left alone. Or maybe they were annoyed by five boats that day. You know, you just don't know. So we have to be cautious. When dolphins follow a boat and jump in the wake, you mean? Oh, that's just fun. They're having fun. They're surfing, yeah. Yeah, that's fun. And it's a free ride. You know, they get a free ride in the, in the bow, right? They're pushing ahead. And they actually bow ride whales because whales will make such a, a push that they'll like get it. So we didn't invent that with boats. <laughs> so do, how deep do dolphins dive? And do they have to decompress if they go deep? So uh, I guess the answer to the second question is no, because they are taking one breath at the surface. They're not breathing compressed air, right? So that's a good thing. Um, it depends on the species. There are over 30 species of dolphin. Um, not all of them have been measured. Um, some of the larger dolphins, like pilot whales, which are actually a dolphin, believe it or not, um, they can go to 1,500 feet, say. That's not unusual. Um, some of the seals and sea lions are actually better divers, believe it or not. They're like master divers, you know, they go up and down and up and down. Sperm whales, which are a toothed whale, they'll go two miles down. But they really, you know, every, everything gets kind of sucked in and they're just doing the important stuff. But yeah, I mean, they're designed for that, basically. But, you know, the, your average dolphin that you see, probably three or four hundred feet, maybe, maybe deeper. but. Probably depends on the fish they're chasing. And, yeah. So a local uh, population has a dorsal fin to the tail. Is that something unique to this area or uh, is it common? 
the local dolphins have their dorsal fins bent. You mean the ones in the Indian River? Um, what's the reason for that? Well, I don't think it's common. It does happen a lot in captivity. Um, I would speculate it's probably nutrition, maybe. It, it wouldn't be normal just because you know they're they're meant to be a stabilizing element, right, on their body. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure I've seen any photos of their neck. So Nick was just saying that there sometimes their fins are cut or bent over from monofilament net or boat injuries, but that's not a normal bend. That's a that's a chop, yeah, which is a little different. Oh, question from yeah, we'll jump in with a Zoom question. How does the behavior of uh, spotted dolphins and bottlenose dolphins differ so that they can coexist in the same niche or habitat? Good question. Um, well, our sense of it, <laughs> I might be a little biased, but. The bottlenose dolphin's temperament is quite different than the spotted. The, um, they're a little more aggressive. And this is the species we know the best, right? From coastal work, from marine parks. Um, the spotted are a little more playful, not as aggressive. But like I, I showed you, there are some interspecific things they do, you know, babysit each other's calves. Um, they fight sometimes, but they help each other. So I guess it's getting to know your neighbor and developing specific relationships with your neighbor too. Like we'll see sometimes traveling pregnant spotted dolphins with pregnant bottlenose dolphins. So like, you know, yeah, I know. So clearly they recognize the other species. I guess it depends on, you know, what's, you know, what's at stake basically. Ooh, the question everybody always asks, when do dolphins sleep? Well, they don't, is the first answer. Um, so what it looks like dolphins do is that it looks like they shut down half of their brain at a time to rest, right? So the studies that have shown that they kind of go into like a, a meditative brainwave state on one side and the other side stays active. So they'll, and I've seen it in the wild actually, they'll be swimming in the, the, the water column and it's like, you look at them and their eyes are closed, but as soon as you make like one little click or just movement, they like, you know, all of a sudden they're alert. So they, they rest on one side of their body and they keep the other side of the body awake. Yeah, which is interesting. So, so I don't, you know, they don't sleep like we think of sleep. Yeah, the question is, could we put monitors on the dolphins to see where they're moving? We could. Um, we choose not to, because you have to kind of capture them and drill a hole through their dorsal fin. And of course, it's a great tool. Uh, many researchers use it, especially for endangered species, to track via satellite. Now it used to be radio, but now you can satellite tag. Um, yeah, it'll tell you where they go. You know, our sense of our particular study area is the animals would never hang around with us in the water if we if we grab them. So we don't really do that. Now, I will tell you that we had a stranded spotted uh, dolphin um, in 2018. He stranded in the Berry Islands, which are kind of way east of uh, Bimini. And he was rescued. He was flown to NASA and rehabilitated. And we saw his photograph with some other researchers we know uh, were working there. and. We could identify him. He was one of the males from our group. And so the Bahamian government, after he was rehabbed, allowed us to release him back with our group. It was incredible. And so in that case, he was already out of the water. So we did put a satellite tag on him. And that guy took off. He went 120 miles the first day. Second day, another 120 miles. He went almost to Cuba. And this is from the satellite data. Hung out there for a month. I was still in the Bahamas, but right on the edge of the sand bank. Then finally came back to his regular group, and he's happy, happily living with his regular group again. So it's a great tool, but you know, do you have to tag them all? Do you, you know, it's it's tough to decide how you're going to do that. Another question. We have a, another question from our Zoom audience. Actually, this is a two-part question. 
are there different dialects among dolphins from different regions? And is there anything that a general citizen can do to volunteer to help with the Wild Dolphin Project? Ooh, good question. Um, yes, dolphins do have dialects. Uh, in fact, they can be really different in adjacent groups, right? So yeah, it's all about the group. Like, how do you know what your group is? So kind of think of it as like, they have a species sound, and then they have dialects, dialects within the species, and then the, the pod probably has a little bit of a, a, a dialect, and then they have their signature whistles. So there's all these levels of identification. And um, yes, uh, Wild Dolphin Project has an online site. If you get a photograph of a spotted dolphin uh, in the Bahamas, you can upload it, and it's through Fluke Books. Uh, you can look on our website, and it probably is in our newsletter too. And yeah, that can help us identify. If you could tell us where you took the photo, and we'll tell you who that dolphin is, and that really helps in location. Um, we have events you can volunteer for. Um, you can come on the boat with us in the summer as an ecotourism kind of thing and help out. And yeah, and you can send money, <laughs> large money. Oh, wait a minute, during a hurricane. <laughs> Can't we get acoustic data? <laughs> Can't we get acoustic data before, during, and after a hurricane? People usually say, what do they do during a hurricane? And we're like, oh, we're back in Florida. Um, and even our acoustic um, devices, we have to pull them up off the bottom because they can just be lost, right? Yeah, so of course, sure, right before we leave but then but it's hard to get back there after a hurricane literally like usually after the hurricanes here we've done relief runs for the locals basically we load our boat you know we our benefactors often give us a chunk of money to go buy generators and stuff we just load our boat and go over there and give them stuff but and then we look for the dolphins like you know but we don't often have a lot of time yeah no i wouldn't i wouldn't say but you know is that like, you know, we would leave, uh, depending on the hurricane, you know, days if not a week before if we saw something big coming. And, yeah, it'd be interesting though, yeah. We have a hurricane follow-up question online. You mentioned a number of different hurricanes that impacted the Bahamas, but you didn't say anything about Dorian. Uh, do you have any data that discuss the impact of Hurricane Dorian on your study populations? Yeah, so Dorian um, actually stopped, <laughs> that was a monster, it's, as you know, the Abacos, it stopped in the middle of Grand Bahama Island over Freeport, right? And then it kind of went north. Um, we didn't, we don't think it had much effect on our spotteds, actually, because they're mostly to the west enough, I guess, that it made a difference. I know the Abacos dolphins had some effect. They studied the bottlenose over there. Um, but still, I'm sure it were big, there were big seas and challenges, you know. But no, we haven't seen any direct way back there. When we observe dolphins, do we use scuba or rebreathers? Uh, neither. We actually just snorkel. Uh, because we're collecting a lot of acoustics, um, although rebreathers would be potentially good for that because they're quiet. Uh, scuba, it's a little noisy because of the bubbles. And the bubbles actually kind of disturb the dolphins sometimes, you know, depending on. You know, they use their own bubbles for aggressive things sometimes. So um, we just snorkel. We find it's just easier to keep up with them. And, um, to maneuver, and we free drive a lot, basically. You said this is 30% mortality for the targets. Do you have any, any idea how they died? Well, uh, I should clarify that we're not sure they died, but we certainly haven't seen them anywhere we've looked or, or you know, found any matches anywhere else. So we assume they died. My guess is drowning would also honestly be exhaustion and drowning or predators. You know, you got. Sharks, they don't need to breathe, right? They can stand in the water. You've got dolphins that have to get to the surface and breathe and, you know, eat and, yeah. So we have never actually seen a dead dolphin in our area. They just kind of are gone. You know, I, I have a colleague that really said, well, you know, maybe they really did go somewhere else, right? Like, uh, that's very possible. It's just that it's a big Bahamas, so we haven't seen any photographs that would tell us that. 
and why they wouldn't come back. So like when we lost our spotteds, what was really interesting is so we would have like a family group was all gone except for like the male that was in the group. Or a juvenile group, they were close buddies, they'd all be there except one. So like, I mean, they're so social, you'd think they'd try like heck to get back if they just got, you know, surfed away or blown away by the storm. But I, I'm guessing drowning would probably be the biggest loss. Where else do spotted dolphins live besides the Bahamas? So the spotted dolphins are uh, endemic to the Atlantic only. So you would find them from uh, maybe New Jersey down to South America, Brazil, and then across to Africa, all through the islands of the Caribbean, Africa, and then on up to uh, maybe Morocco kind of area. Yeah, they're, they're not well studied. Our group is probably the best studied in the world. Um, but the islands, any of the islands, really, all through the Caribbean, I mean, all through the Bahamas. I wish I had 5,000 boats. I'd, like, spread them out. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, they're a neat species. Yep. Oh, yeah, yes, uh -huh. absolutely. No, no question, okay. more Oop, there it is it's a delay <laughs> i've got one more neat question from one of our online viewers where do the group allegiances lie for the hybrid offspring that you mentioned Ooh. what a cool question cool question uh yes so hybrid offspring are are rare so we've only seen a few that morphologically look like hybrids although all around the world now you can see people are finding hybrids in mixed groups like um there's always been reports like in the Eastern Tropical Pacific where the tuna fleets have decimated a lot of the populations. Tons of observations of spinner dolphins and pantropical spotted dolphins showing strange shape colored dolphins, right? So we know they hybridize, but remember if you hybridize to keep that genetic formula, you have to mate with another hybrid, right? So a lot of species hybridize, but it gets diluted back. So if you have a spotted bottlenose mix, say that animal grows up, mates with a, a bottlenose, so then all of a sudden it's less of a hybrid, right? Where do the allegiances go? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I would hope with mom. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know. I, I'm seeing some hands go up in the audience. We do have enough time for maybe two or three more questions here at the Blake. Do you mind repeating that for the zoo? Does temperature have a difference whether they have male or female yeah, offspring? Sure. Right. Um, well, I don't know about in the wild. I'm trying to think if it's been studied in captivity. Yeah, I don't know. Good question. There's a research project for some young person. <laughs> if, if your parents let you study that. Is a question back there? Yes, they are. There was a, so, oh sorry, so uh, hybrids are sexually viable, yes. They're, almost dolphins have hybridized with 13 other species in captivity, okay? One good example was in Hawaii, there was a bottlenose dolphin, hope I get this right, that hybridized with a, not a pilot whale, was it? Pseudorca, yeah, maybe. No, it wasn't. Yeah, it was Pseudorca, right. So this is like a, a false killer whale. It's like a kind of a pilot whale sized dolphin. Anyway, they were both in captivity. They hybridized. The offspring then grew up, mated with another dolphin. So, yes. You know, they have, they actually hybridize fairly easily because they have uh, the same amount of chromosomes and they don't seem to have some of the impediments that other species do with immune systems and things like that. Um, but again, you know, if you want to build a hybridized community, you have to have a lot of hybrid, hybrids, right? That's happened in Africa. There are a couple of species of monkeys that had that happen. They lived adjacently. They hybridized enough that all of a sudden the hybrid was a community, you know, so they were onto themselves. So yes, they are often viable. There are blue whale and fin whale hybrids that were viable too. They found from old whaling records. So yeah, 
kind of crazy. So yeah, the question is about their immune system and does it get weaker? Listen, dolphins get all the diseases we do. You know, they get cancers, they, they get bacterial infections, they get viral infections, they get fungus. I mean, this is, excuse me, this is not unusual, you know, in the wild, it's just what they do. You know, wild populations have to have a certain amount of immunity, but there's horrible viruses that can go around and kill you know, communities like Morbilla virus is one we've had here, lobal mycosis in the intercoastal, it's like white goopy thing that we see in a lot of the dolphins. So yeah, I mean, it's nature, right? Yeah. All right, guys, unfortunately, that's it for time. Uh, if I could have you guys give Dr. Herzing one more big round of applause as a thank you. I. I would imagine that if you have more questions for her, we do have to get out of the library here in a couple minutes, but if, uh, if you want it, I bet you should be happy to chat for at least a couple minutes. She has a little bit of a drive to get home. Uh, I do want to get serious for just a second right now. Uh, believe it or not, we had about 130 people here with us live at the Blake. We had another 200, just under 200 watching on Zoom. And I know some of you, I know some of you did not make it to the lecture that I gave two weeks ago about Florida's water quality issues. And I want to urge all of you, if you haven't seen it already, to go watch that recording on our website. And here's why. It's very relevant right now. When I gave that presentation, I mentioned that there was a chance that we would see Lake Okeechobee discharges this year. As of two days ago, they've begun. We are currently receiving water from Lake Okeechobee into the St. Lucie River and the Indian River Lagoon. We want zero discharges. This estuary was not meant to be connected to Lake Okeechobee. And as we talked about two weeks ago, those discharges immediately start causing environmental harm. So if you haven't had a chance to see that webinar, I would urge you to sit down, spend an hour, and learn a little bit more about our water quality problems and our algae issues.